My name is Harold Furt, Scott Roth, and I am pleased to welcome you here to this session of the Hudson Institute Center for the Economics of the Internet. We're very pleased today to have a special guest, Daniel Berninger. Uh, I will introduce him in just a moment. Uh, our next event is going to be Tuesday, February 6th, here again at Hudson. We're very pleased to have Commissioner Michael O'Reilly of the Federal Communications Commission will speak with us. Uh, Daniel Berninger is uh, a familiar face here in Washington. He is uh, a serial entrepreneur. Uh, he is uh, 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 an independent communications architect and founder of VCXC. I, I love this idea of communications architect. I, I, I like that combination. Daniel's work started with the original assessment of VOIP at Bell Laboratories in 1995 technical contributions to the founding of Free World Dial-Up in 1996, and continued at Vocal uh, T Communications, where he led the first VOIP deployment at Verizon, HP, and NASA. He organized the first ever meeting with the Federal Communications Commission on the question of internet regulation, and won a VON Pioneer Award as co-founder of the Vaughn Coalition. Daniel led the founding teams created the business model, and recruited the CEOs for ITXC and Vonage that became public companies employing several thousand people. Daniel is also uh, the, uh, the lead plaintiff in what may become one of the great landmark Supreme Court cases, uh, possibly of all time. It is a challenge to... That's the challenge for today, is to convince you of that, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, so Daniel and others have challenged uh, the Federal Communications Commission's uh, network neutrality uh, order uh, from, from 2015, and uh, as, as well as, as other parts of uh, the order more recently. And we're going to learn today from Daniel about uh, uh, the status of the case before the Supreme Court and more generally about uh, what is happening with network neutrality and the, the, uh, uh, how that affects the Internet. Uh, he's going to present this from the perspective of uh, a serial entrepreneur in the Internet who has had uh, great success at launching companies and developing new technologies. Uh, and for our online audience today, uh, you're welcome to uh, submit questions for Mr. Berninger at uh, hashtag Hudson events. And uh, well, Daniel and I will have a conversation uh, between now and about 1 o'clock. And after that, we'll open it up to the audience for Q&A. Okay. Well, thank you, Harold, for arranging this, and thank you, Hudson Institute. Now, has anyone heard of Daniel Berninger versus Federal Communication Commission? It's basically a secret, but a few people have heard about it. And, and so this is essentially the first event that I'm doing on this topic um, about the Supreme Court case itself. And so you're lucky. You're all pioneers. You can tell your children and grandchildren you were there for the first meeting about uh, this case, uh, Daniel Berger versus FCC. Um, in about 15 minutes, if I have, I'm just going to kind of give you the big picture of how we got to here. Um, the Supreme Court case itself is what I believe will be the end of this process that started um, 20 years ago, you know, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Um, this question about the relationship between government and communication in the United States. So first, just about the case itself. Um, I had a company called Hello Digital that I founded about 2010. Uh, that was about, well, and, and as Harold mentioned, a few companies before that. But Hello Digital was meant to put voice behind websites. So today, you travel the web, and you know, as far as you know, you're alone. You go to a New York Times article. You go to even Facebook, where you, know, you might sort of asynchronously get some feedback and some likes. Um, as far as you know, you're alone. But in fact, as you go through the internet, there are lots of people at all the pages that you land on. Um, some pages have more people there than others. So if you're reading a USA Today article, there might be a couple hundred people also reading that same 
article at the same time. What we were doing with Hello Digital, and we're still doing to some extent on the web while we're waiting for the Supreme Court case to play out, is putting you in touch with the other people who are at that page. So today we, we have you know, things called commenting, and you can comment and asynchronously follow people responding to that page. But what we were doing is you click through, you get to an operator. The operator says, hello, um, yes, we have several conversations going on. What would you like to talk about? And then the operator bridges um, you with whoever else might be there. And just so the intent of that as a sort of a new way to, to create a voice communication is a new way of discovery, right? So normally, um, as we pass through life, you are in contexts that have people of common interest, like this moment here. Um, and so you might have something in common with people. But in fact, with the internet, is essentially this massive decomposition of everyone into their interests, um, whether it's cats or Sp Britney Spears or Arab Spring or you know, Supreme Court cases, uh, Daniel Berger versus FCC. And so what we were doing was allow you to talk and, you know, moderating it and the operators managing, you know, filtering who's coming in and out. But, you know, just literally talk in high definition to anyone and literally anyone on earth. Um, so the nature of the Internet would allow us to have high quality voice conversations with anyone on earth. So we were headed down the road to do that. And, and, and I had worked pretty hard on advocacy in the United States to turn to upgrade the voice quality in your phones. And so, so you could actually have high, high quality voice on your phones. Today, when you talk on the phone, the voice quality you get is the same voice quality we had in 1934. And keep in mind, now this is a regulatory story as to why that happened. Um, it's an absolutely amazing thing. But literally in 1934, when you talked on the phone, you had the same voice quality we have today. Um, and that's, again, a, a consequence of regulations. If we think about traditional information technology, um, you get a new version of that thing every year. So we're, we're up to iPhone 10. In 50 years, we'll be at iPhone 60. So you have an ecosystem where you have constant innovation, which is the non-regulated information technology ecosystem, and an ecosystem where you're regulated, which actually there's just no innovation at all. Um, and so as an entrepreneur, I want to be in this the, the, the non-regulated information technology ecosystem. I didn't want to be pulled into the regulated ecosystem where I need to go ask permission to the Federal Communication Commission. So with Hello Digital, I thought for a couple years I was in the non-regulated world. Um, but the FCC had a problem in that the things that it had been regulating were all dying. The telephone network, the voice quality, you know, the call that you know, you imagine if you don't improve voice quality for 80 years, people might stop using it. And that's, in fact, what happened. And so the voice aspect of the communication business was going away. The data aspect of the communication business was exploding. And the FCC, you know, made the decision not to shut the doors. They said, well, yeah, 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 we were invented in 1934 to regulate voice. But this voice business is going away, so we're going to leap over into the data business. And that's how I ended up with a, an appeal, first to the DC Circuit, saying they couldn't leap over into the data world. Um, and now we lost at the DC Circuit, and now we're appealing to the Supreme Court. Um, and in the meantime, so my case is against the, the uh, Chairman Wheeler's version of the regulation of the internet. Um, and since then, Chairman Pai has uh, come up with his own version of the regulation of the Internet. But again, keep in mind, the last five FCC chairmen have had their version of the regulation of the Internet. They actually all have the same problem. Um, so uh, Chairman Powell tried to regulate the Internet. Um, Chairman Martin tried to regulate the Internet. Uh, Chairman Janikowski, Chairman Wheeler, and now Chairman... Uh, pie. Now, so why would I think, or why would the Supreme Court want to step in in this process um, about regulating the internet? And and the answer is because the Supreme Court actually has responsibility uh, to enforce the Constitution, uh, to to protect the Bill of Rights, and and ideally, you know, insert some kind of sense of reality about what's going on. So again, so Daniel Berger versus FCC essentially says.
three things, okay? And, and these three things apply to all of the efforts of the FCC um, to regulate the Internet. First thing is that there is such a thing as a constitution, and the constitution delegates authority for creating laws to Congress. Administrative agencies cannot make up laws on their own. Um, period. End of story. Um, now, the administrative state has, has found lots of ways to bend that rule, and, and, um, and I, you might have seen pictures where Congress you know, might produce this much worth of paperwork, and um, the administrative agencies, you know, many, many miles and feet of paperwork in terms of rules, but it still comes back to it all has to start with some sort of a grant of delegation from Congress to the agency. And in this case, with respect to the Internet, um, the FCC does not have that delegation. Um, they have some theories about where they can find in their rules, but I'm arguing that the, the Supreme Court has to look at the authority that the FCC has and, and see if the Supreme Court agrees that, oh, no, you know, do you or don't you have authority to regulate the Internet? So that's the first argument uh, in Daniel Berger versus FCC. You read all the legislation that created the FCC, whether it was in 1934 or 1996 as it was updated. And again, these are 96 was not whole new legislation. It was an update to 1934. And again, just sort of anchor yourself in common sense. What was 1934 about? What you know, the, the FCC as it was created. Was it about the internet? No, I don't think it was about the internet. In 1934, remember Hitler's wreaking havoc in, in Europe. Um, FDR was the president that signed the Communication Act of 1934. There were about 8 million dial, not even barely dial telephones in 1934. Um, and so whatever is the task that Congress sought for, to solve with the FCC, and in particular with respect to a monopoly AT&T, um, it's pretty much, it's quite a leap to say that, oh, we're going to, that whatever it is Congress had in mind at that point applies to the Internet. And then we, even if we go forward and we look at what Congress was saying in the 1996 Act, um, and again, they, they had a bunch of things they wanted to update there. But even at that moment in 1996, the Internet had how many people on it? Anybody know? About 30 million people. Um, it was a whole bunch of early adopters. Um, and so the Internet was sort of the golden goose at the time. And, and so Congress actually wrote in, as a part of the legislation, the FCC shall not regulate the Internet. Just put those plain words. Um, now, unfortunately, again, to get to where we are today, um, they've had to ignore those words and sort of wave their hands. And so that's essentially the second thing. Um, that we want the Supreme Court to speak to is, is there something in, in the legislation? Now, let's say, um, let's say Congress did, even tomorrow, um, issue some laws that say the FCC can regulate the Internet in some context. Well, you still have a Bill of Rights. Now, and the Bill of Rights includes something called the First Amendment. And so in my case, um, it's primarily, I think, of Berninger versus FCC as a First Amendment case. Um, where I'm arguing that the first, the 45 words of the First Amendment um, say explicitly, um, government shall not mess with communication. So to begin with, the Federal Communication Commission itself is a very strange Orwellian thing um, when, when you read those 45 words. The 45 words are a prohibition against government messing with communication. And, and yet we have this agency called the Federal Communication Commission, which seems pretty much at odds um, with the First Amendment. And the way that played out was that Congress had its rationale for giving that authority back in 1934, and there were First Amendment fights that were played out over time. Um, but all those in the context of voice, all those in the context of the PSDN, the telephone network, and so it's, it's a reach to, uh, it's, it's a ridiculous reach um, to say that those questions about the FCC and the First Amendment answered the question about the FCC and the Internet. And so in Berninger versus FCC, I, I'm just stating, and oh, by the way, there's nothing in the legislation that actually says the FCC 
this FCC or any FCC can regulate the Internet. Oh, and even if they could, they haven't done anything to answer questions about the First Amendment. And, and, and this is not, this is, again, as an entrepreneur, I don't have any particular authority. I'm basically just pray, hoping and praying that the Constitution of the United States uh, will be enforced by the Supreme Court. And as it was explained to me, I, I was here um, a couple weeks ago with Floyd Abrams, who is a big champion of the First Amendment, and he explained to me that the, the two things are related, that the reason the Bill of Rights, initially the, found, the creators of the Constitution, Madison and all, you know, they, they didn't want there to be a Bill of Rights. Okay? They, you know, the, the question came up, should we have a Bill of Rights? And the group that actually wrote the Constitution said, um, no, we don't need it because um, there's nothing in, that we're, in terms of these affirmative authorities that we're giving to government which inhibits or you know, goes against, say, search and seizure or First Amendment or, or speech, et cetera. So they said there's no reason why we need to pair a uh, Bill of Rights with the Constitution. But when they tried to get the Constitution approved by the states, the states and the various advocates that were, had anxiety about federal power said, no, no, we want a Bill of Rights. That even, you know, that it's not enough that you show that, that they don't, those powers don't exist by omission. Um, we actually want an affirmative belt and suspenders approach that says, no, actually, you can't do these things. And why would they be particularly worried about speech, for example, or search, et cetera, um, is because the long history of humanity up to that point in 1889, and there isn't anything that should change our minds in 17, uh, 2018, government in interest in controlling communication is intense, okay? That the population's ability to be the population and have freedoms and hold government accountable are entirely tied up in communication. And so the entire ability of the population to organize, whether it's speech, free speech, whether it's religion, whether it's to petition your, to, whether it's to assemble, whether it's via press, okay? That checklist is the entire source of power of the population to hold government accountable. And so as we look around the world, various governments in varying degrees have pushed back on that capability of the population. Um, but fortunately, when America was founded, um, the founders had a very, very recent experience of suppression of the press, suppression of religion, suppression of speech, suppression of petitions, suppression of assembly. Very, very recent experience. And so they said, no, no, we're going to explicitly prohibit government from doing that. So now we come back for today, and I'm a se saying, okay, Mr. Supreme Court, you're in charge. Uh, you have a supervisory authority over the lower courts. You need to just hold them accountable and ask that question about um, the Constitution and First Amendment. Now, there's a last thing in terms of my journey as an entrepreneur um, that I rely on and sort of I hold on to as my conviction as to why I'm pursuing this case. Now, again, I should not be here. I would much rather, you guys should all have Hello Digital. I should already be a billionaire. Um, but such as it is, I, I need to fight this case. Um, and, and, and so we're going to wait a little bit until Hello Digital's there. But the last thing I'm hanging on to is what we would call, what I'll call reality, objective reality. Is there anybody here that doubts objective reality? Um, you know, so even if the Supreme Court says the sun's not going to come up tomorrow morning, do you think the sun's going to come up tomorrow morning? Yeah. So in other words, even if there is some kind of legal way for um, the government to say, I'm going to regulate the Internet, I would say, no, that's problematic even for reality. That what we have, you know, and, and it's sort of the this question and sort of about regulation of the internet is, is a really nice case study and sort of a simple case study for what ails America as we speak. In other words, what is sort of the divisions that uh, are playing out in America? And that you have these battles between ideologies, an ideology of, with great conviction on the left and an ideology with great conviction on the right. Um, but and, and they are fighting furiously over this question of regulation of the Internet. And, and the depth of the analysis um, of these two ideologies is, is the Internet important? And they both nod. And then they say, well, therefore, 
the private sector has to control it, or therefore, on the left, the government has to control it. And that's the depth. Of it. And, and then these ideologies, you know, argue and argue and argue and argue and, and get nowhere through five different FCCs, five different chairmen. But where I come from, and actually having to build these services, actually literally having to have meetings with the AT&Ts and the Verizons of the world, actually, you know, having meetings with the Googles, having, you know, actually serve customers. Because ultimately, the only way, even a Verizon or an AT&T, the only way Hello Digital will be successful is it attracts customers, and the customers are excited about the product, um, and they adopt it, and then I become a billionaire, uh, et cetera. So you are sort of, as an entrepreneur, you are tied to reality. And so the last part that I just want to hit on before we get on questions is this question of reality, that ultimately the ideological debate in the case of internet regulation and in the case of a lot of things in Washington, D.C., has become unhinged from reality, that there isn't any reality that the two ideologies are fighting about, and that in the case of the internet, we had 20 years of experience of the non-regulated internet from 1995 to 2015. And in that 20 years, um, we saw, and again, the non-regulated internet, we saw an explosion of the capacity of the internet. Um, in 1995, you know, so some of us, or many of us were here, and who was here in 1995? There was, you know, trying to get communication. In 1995, if you wanted to make a phone call to London, you were paying a buck five, a buck 25 for that phone call in 1995. Um, as an entrepreneur, I created a company called ITXC. We, um, turn that London telephone call into two local calls, a local call, say, in Washington, D.C., and a local call in uh, London, and we bridged that over the Internet. We created a company that did that, uh, and we collapsed, as an entrepreneurial effort, international calling rates. So it wasn't regulators that took it from $1.25 to $0.05. Cents. It was entrepreneurs that did that. Um, and also, you know, your smartphone that you have that you, you know, you, today has, let's say, a 50 meg connection. That 50 meg connection, which you're getting wireless, would have cost $10,000 a month as a regulated service in 1995. So we sit in 1995 and, and we say, so let's have this, have this experiment. Let's not regulate the internet f for 20 years. And we get to the end of that process and it's just the most amazing explosion of communication capacity the world has ever seen, an explosion of value that the world has ever seen. So if you want to have a discussion with me about we have way too much communication, I'm there, you know. But if you want to say there's some kind of bad thing that happened, that the, the operators were holding something back, um, that we don't have enough communication, then, then you are disconnected from reality. But they nonetheless created this debate, sort of this notion of discrimination. And if you go back to where this particular debate came from um, was a paper by a Professor Wu at Columbia. And in that paper, he said two things. One, that if you have the internet, we, we, we're going to need something called the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission type thing, where everyone that approaches the internet should get equal treatment. We don't want people to be discriminated against when they approach the internet to get service from the internet, sort of like an equal opportunity. But the problem with that analogy, and it has a force, you know, it, it makes sense, is that he's comparing people to bits. So on the one hand, we have non-discrimination against people to non-discrimination against bits. And you now have just lost the, your link to reality at that point. And that also we can go check over that 20 years. No, the one thing the carriers are great at is not discriminating against customers. Because a customer for a carrier is like a customer for a hotel. That the hotel exists, um, that you, you know, you've, it's a fixed cost, you've got to heat the whole thing. Every incremental customer you get in your hotel that fills a room is pure profit. And it is the same thing for the carriers. Um, in fact, it's even worse, because even at least the hotels kind of has value as a real estate investment. But a network, if you don't use the capacity that's sitting there, it's gone. It's not like energy where you have this, um, you know, you have like a, you can, you can store oil. So if you don't like the price of your oil, you can store it and it'll just sit there and nobody uses it. 
But in a communication network, any capacity that's there that's not somebody's not paying for is completely lost. And so um, you have this, this, so this notion of you know, creating this analogy between discrimination of an equal opportunity and discrimination in the internet just doesn't work. And the last thing is this notion of neutrality was invented in, in the paper. And what he called neutral was the ability to plug a television, say, or any appliance into different places within the, the electrical network. So you buy a TV in New York, you can plug it in in California, and he called that neutrality. Well, that aspect of uniformity, um, the internet already had at the time, has far more greater degree uh, than the electrical network has. You can buy something in Washington, D.C., you can plug it in in Paris. Um, my daughter is here working as me as an intern. She went to um, Paris. Everything that was associated with the internet continued to work. You know, we could communicate perfectly fine everything that was associated with the internet. Everything that was actually regulated um, leading up to that point, you know, traditional texting, traditional voice calls, stopped working. Okay? So the internet in and of itself is far, far more neutral in the sense that he originally imagined uh, than, than the electrical network is or than, than any utility. Um, so again, I'd, you know, as our first talk about Daniel Berger versus FCC, I hope you track the case and uh, things turn out well. Well, thank you very much for that uh, overview of the case and uh, the, the history of the internet. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the, uh, uh, the bad old days of the internet that Professor Wu is complaining about? Uh, uh, when he wrote his paper 15 years ago, was there discrimination on the internet? Was the, was were there real world examples of people not getting access to the internet? Right. So, again, the, one of the things we are trying to deal with reality is distinguish between past and future. Right. So, if I want to be grounded in reality, um, I can you know make any statement I want about the future. So I'm going to say I believe you know Martians are going to land on the White House lawn next week. Okay, now, I'm not lying. It might happen. You can't prove me wrong. Um, but now when we're talking about things that are in the past, that things that actually happen, then we need to pause a little bit and really ask ourselves a question, um, is that true? And, and is what you're asserting true? And so we go back, and, 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 and the paper that was originally written that started the controversy wasn't doing that. It was not claim complaining about anything that actually had happened. It was speculating about things that could happen, uh, essentially while all the, the efforts to regulate the internet today are doing. They're essentially speculating that things could happen in the future. Um, so there weren't any problems. Now, in that interim period, it's hard to even fathom the amount of transactions on the internet. So pick a big number, trillions, billion, you know, peta, whatever, sextillions. In other words, there's just so many transactions on the internet over 15 years. It's mind-boggling. But within that mass, they do come up with you know, a handful of anecdotes um, in the journey from 15 years to 2015. That they will, in the Wheeler order, they, they list a few of them. And, and again, you know, in sort of a, a rule of law, a presumption of innocence, um, you can't just leap from a couple anecdotes um, to a whole regulation of the internet. Um, and so they, I mean, there was incremental ones. Uh, I was actually, in the 20 year fight, I was originally on the, um, the ACLU, by the way, is against my First Amendment case at this point. Um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, by the way, is against, uh, is it all in favor of regulating the internet, they're against me. Um, but originally, I, I, you know, I saw the logic in, in arguing that the carriers, which had 98% um, you know, of their revenues in voice, I saw the logic that, well, they might not be so thrilled about all the things that I was doing in, in voice. So, for example, in Vonage, Vonage came after ITXC. The theory behind Vonage is originally for connecting voice over the Internet, you acquired two computers. Somebody said, well, that's nice, but 
let's just create a chip for one of these computers, and then we're going to put that chip in a little box, and you can put that box on your desk, and you can plug your phone at home into that little box, and then send your phone call over the internet to some central place. And so that's what happened with Vonage. You know, this, this chip was invented as a communication architect, you know, I'm like, well, okay, well, how can we use this new chip? And we created Vonage. Um, and what happened from there was that Vonage was the first to invent something called a flat rate domestic calling. So up until the point of the internet, up until the point of voice over IP, there was no flat rate domestic calling. You paid basically by where you, you, the destination was. And again, it makes a certain amount of sense. Well, if I'm calling California, it should cost more than if I'm calling New York from Washington, DC. Um, but they, there was sort of tariffed rates through the regulatory process that set all those rates. And it was impossible as an entrepreneur to just really come up and sort of aggregate a bunch of traffic to, to get a business model that would work for flat rate domestic calling. But as soon as we had this ability to take all of the calls through the internet to the central location, we were able to create flat rate domestic calling, so $30 anywhere you want to call. And again, we all assume that today, but that again was done by an entrepreneur effort not by the regulators, but the regulators at that point were going to spend an awful lot of time. Well, you know, it got a little weird at the end of tariff rates because it cost a whole lot more to cross t call across town than it cost to cr call um, across states. And that was just getting really upside down uh, in terms of their logic that you should pay by distance. Um, so anyway, long answer, no, there was nothing that they could actually point to that would be a crisis. But again, we don't we never really make the leap beyond ideology. So that if, if I have an ideology that says, oh, anything important has to be controlled by government, um, then there, I cannot be talked out of it. We've seen the uh, commission just uh, uh, a little over a month ago uh, uh, repeal Chairman Wheeler's uh, network neutrality order. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the kind of the atmospherics that have been going on around that? Uh, what, what has this done to Chairman Pai's life? Yeah, so one of the dots that, uh, you know, the case that we'll make to the Supreme Court is that the fact that you've left this alone, that you've let now we've gone through five FCC chairmen trying to figure out how to regulate the Internet absent any authority, it has led to sort of a banana republic mode of operation that fundamentally the FCC chairman becomes a very, very powerful entity uh, to the extent he's not subject to the Constitution, to the extent that he doesn't need any legislation, he doesn't need Congress, to the extent that he can ignore the First Amendment. And, and that's essentially how we got to where we are today. And so a Chairman Pai becomes a very, very powerful person. He becomes a king. There is no limit, according to the, the orders that the FCC is putting out, as to the constraints on his power. And so just imagine you know, the fulcrum point, the tension that would be hinging on the decision of the master of the Internet, the master of the fu future of communication. And so you know, the one thing I do agree with in terms of the advocates for regulating the internet is that, yeah, a lot rides on um, that decision. And that, you know, as I said, sort of in the grand scheme of the relationship of a government to its population, um, it's a big deal as to the extent that the government controls communication. And then you can think of it in terms of even, let's say, that decision, whether or not the government as discretionary authority to regulate the internet is a decision about whether or not there exists private property in cyber, cyberspace. In other words, up until 2015, every new startup that I created, and half of them failed, which I'm, and I'm not going to speak about them, and don't, don't ask me to, um, every one you create, I didn't pick up the phone and call the FCC and said, is this OK? Can I do this? I would just go create it, see if it would work, um, make adjustments, and eventually things like, you know, Vonage and, and the company ITC gets the FCC's attention, and they're saying, well, gee whiz, we thought we were the ones regulating voice services, 
we were we thought we were the ones regulating interstate commerce and communications and so then they call me up and they say well come down and talk to us but the presumption was in my favor ok and they understood that and they had abided by that all the way up until 2015 that I had a presumption of innocence government intervention had a presumption of guilt that they actually had to prove that there was something I was doing that was against the public interest in order to regulate me and that's a big deal and essentially that's that's the switch between what is owned and what is not owned right and there's the difference between if someone rents a car they don't even bother washing the thing forget about vacuuming the inside or fixing the engine I'm gonna if you don't own that thing that you're working with you don't improve it and so if I find out that anything I do and I need to go ask permission of the FCC for everything then I'm every service that I build in the future including held a low digital is built on top of government property that government can then tell me you know what I can and can't do and the track record in terms of me sitting and talking to government is not good you know I I you know my parents give government sort of a benefit of the doubt that you know they know they're well-meaning they're trying to do things no I've sat there and talked to these guys for 20 years they don't have my benefit down anymore so to the extent that I so I'm told that no you're gonna have to ask the FCC for mission for every future company then I'm out then I'm gonna go become a barista at Starbucks or something but problem well let's just quickly review some of the the history of network neutrality regulation so we have professor Wu's paper from about 15 years ago and then you mentioned there were five FCC chairman who had various forms of regulation of the internet now the courts didn't necessarily take kindly to each of these did they right and so again the struggle has always been over the whole process and in fact just take a two seconds to go back the process that we're discussing besides going back to beginning humanity invention of voice invention of language we bring it up to let's say 1956 with the AT&T consent decree and the antitrust decision was that AT&T could not go into computing and so when AT&T couldn't go into computing the FCC itself couldn't go into computing because all the FCC did was regulate AT&T so you roll that forward 60 years and it was a bunch of decision points along the line where AT&T said it wanted to go into computing and we had to decide or AT&T would go into computing claim it was telecom all the way through the recent decisions by each of the chairman to sort of again preserve this line between what was information technology non-regulated and what was telecom regulated was played out and was eventually was held up until 2015 in the Wheeler order and so ultimately you know it was clear that on the information services side of things there were amazing things happening and for a very long time you know so my first meeting with the FCC was with Reid Hahn in the 90s for a very long time they were willing to let you know well enough alone that we don't want to disrupt the internet and 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 but eventually and they tried sort of modest ways to tweak and intervene in the internet and it and it went to a Comcast versus FCC case where the FCC lost you know at the DC circuit and then they sort of made an adjustment and then there was another order and then it was Verizon versus FCC and they lost and made an adjustment but essentially what happened over that period leading up to the US telecom at at the DC circuit was the FCC was incrementally getting a theory building a theory in conjunction with the DC circuit as to why they were able to regulate the internet and and let me just give you what that theory is and it's unhinged from reality but a theory was sort of incrementally that they built up first they got a presumption of guilt against the telcos that the DC circuit agreed that the 
telephone companies without any evidence have a incentive and an ability to discriminate against people using the internet and so they just said that by fiat there was there was no market study no market power study no market failure they just said that but that happened and the other thing they got was something called the FCC is responsible for protecting something called a virtuous cycle so a virtuous cycle is just you know good things happening that that feed in a feedback loop on each other and we certainly saw a virtuous cycle in information technology as it went from you know 30 million people on the internet to 3 billion people and there was certainly a virtuous cycle that was responsible for that but the leap they made was that oh wait a minute this virtuous cycle happened without the FCC there was no FCC in that 20-year period managing the virtuous cycle but what the DC Circuit agreed to in these multiple cases well yeah presumption against guilt against the telcos yeah the FCC kind of should be managing this virtuous cycle and therefore the FCC can regulate the internet and that brought us to 2015 now chairman will pie has unwound some of that but it still all had a problem with the Constitution and reality and in the 2015 court case and in use to the DC Circuit used the Chevron deference right that you describe the sort of say I haven't described that yet by the way well you introduced the concept okay so under Chevron the court sort of says this is a technical issue we're gonna defer to the technical agency to to make that decision and that's one of the central parts of your case as well as I understand it right tell us about the the limitations of Chevron deference in your right so again the big theme here as an entrepreneur is I want a government that's predictable I want rule of law I want there to be things called private property I want to just live my life I don't want I want to be at home in my kitchen I don't want government sitting on my couch not regulating me but just sort of watching me and so all you know but in order for government government there's a lot of people that very very strongly ideologically believe that the government needs to control the internet and so those folks cannot be talked out of that that theory and so then they have a problem and you know how are they going to get there and one of the tools they had was this notion of Chevron deference which is a Supreme Court precedent that said to the extent that there's ambiguity in what the agency's supposed to do according to legislation the agency gets to some flexibility to create it to answer that ambiguity and so in the case that in 2015 that affirmed the Wheeler order the that was the whole argument that the DC Circuit made that there's ambiguity and we're actually not going to even judge the merits of what the FCC has done we're just going to wave our hand and say well there's ambiguity FCC can do whatever it wants and again it's problematic because you know ambiguity is in the eye of the beholder oh no actually there was an ambiguity that the the legislation actually says they cannot regulate the internet and so would when you create sort of this opening to go look for ambiguity people will see this ambiguity everywhere if it suits their you know the destination that they're trying to get to and that's part of the problem that Chairman Pai is going to have is he's used that same ambiguity so the ambiguity supposedly gives the FCC the bar the ability to decide to regulate the internet or not but again sort of finishing up with the Supreme Court case what the Supreme Court has to decide is oh wait okay I understand the DC Circuit supplied this ambiguity question of the Chevron deference but do I the Supreme Court go along with that I'm the one you know the Supreme Court created this thing the Chevron deference thing about 40 years ago I get to decide how it gets applied and one of the limitations and how it gets applied is you can't claim ambiguity for major questions for things that alter the rotation of the planet in other words when the FCC did what it did it exploded the share of the economy that the FCC was regulating it was regulating voice telephony that was dying okay and dying for reasons of regulation as I said they 
some by some magic managed to not improve voice quality. It's like you know having a world just nothing but dirt roads, and it's just and people don't question it. But anyway, the thing that they were regulating was going away. And when they leaped over to the data side, they expanded their share of the economy tenfold. All of a sudden, they're regulating everything. They claimed to regulate everything with an IP address. Now, the way they did that with sort of bureaucratic shenanigans is they said, well, we regulate telephone numbers, and we declare by fiat telephone numbers and IP addresses are the same thing. N nobody, I would, if they asked me, I'd say, no, 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 they're not the same thing. Um, but they just by fiat said that. Now, when they did that, they moved, telephone numbers were voice services for the most part, texting maybe a little bit, um, dial-up internet back in the 90s. Oh, what has IP addresses? Anybody? Everything. Washing machines, toasters, the internet of things, cars, everything. So by that sort of, just sort of, Bureaucratic, some of you know, was in the lawyers doing this. And apologies to lawyers. Uh, I'm obviously not a lawyer. Uh, you know, they just said, "Oh, we don't know what we don't know," um, but we're just going to declare telephone numbers to be the same thing as IP addresses. That gives us lots of regulatory authority. Yeah, it sure does. Um, it gives you authority over everything. Essentially, is there anything that's not going to have an IP address as time goes on? I could keep asking questions all day, but let me analyze uh, <laughs> the questions. Uh, I'm going to open up the floor, and again, for our online audience, uh, at Hudson, uh, hashtag Hudson Events. Uh, okay. So uh, the gentleman here on the second row gets the first question. Thank you, Gerald Chandler, and thank you for coming. Uh, you've made the argument that uh, uh, suppliers will treat everybody equally. Do you uh, want to make the argument they should treat everybody equally without regulation, or that it's quite all right for them to say that some people uh, just get higher price service? Okay, so so I'm I'm going to restate your question, and you tell me if that's correct. So the, he, his question was, I've made the argument that service providers will treat everybody equally. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, so I have not made that argument. Okay, um, I'm not making a prediction about how suppliers will treat their customers. Uh, so let me just say what I am arguing. I'm arguing that... My question is, if they don't treat their customers equally, they don't know the future... I'm saying if they don't treat their customers equally, and we don't know whether they will or won't, but if they won't, does that bother you? So what I'm saying, so just, I just want to be clear, because I'm really saying some very simple things. One. There's a constitution, and the constitution says, oh, Congress is going to make some laws to decide what the FCC can and can't do. Um, step one. Step two is, whatever laws they make, they're contingent on getting an exception to the First Amendment in the case of communication. So let me just sort of answer your question more directly. Um, I believe in, essentially, a presumption of innocence, that I'm not going to rely on government to answer that question, that anxiety about people not being treated equally. Um, that because I actually have looked back at the track record, and there's nothing in the track record that says, oh boy, I, I really want government to do that. Um, government has no track record of actually doing anything. That all the sort of things that we have anxiety about of an AT&T, those are things of AT&T working together with government. It's not things that AT&T did on its own. Um, for a very long time, um, after 1934, it was illegal to do any kind of attachment, to do any kind of innovation on the telephone network. Um, that was government that did that. And so you roll that forward to this present moment, and we internally have sort of this gut anxiety about service providers. But keep in mind where that anxiety came from. That came from service provider working with government to protect their, their proprietary monopoly. If we now decide in 2015, which we have decided, um, and there's a question of whether or not Chairman Pai has undone that, if we put government in there, it will only be, in fact, in, in the dissent that um, Judge Williams said, 
he said, well, no, what you are doing will create the thing that you're trying to address. Gentleman in the back. And please identify yourself. John Feroldi, Charter Communications. I'd like to amplify from the last comment first, and that is I have no incentive to discriminate against customers as a service provider. That's my comment to that. As far as I'd like to bring up an analogy, ride-hailing services have drawn attention of regulators, like Internet regulation. Isn't it indicative of government regulating progress? So I think I get what you're asking, but let me just sort of broaden it a little bit. And that what we really want, and in terms of to get to the future that we want to get to, the Internet as whatever it was in 1995 and whatever it was in 2005 and whatever it was in 2015, we want the Internet to continue to unfold into whatever it needs to become. And at any given point, in fact, I'm sort of anti-Internet in terms of I'm not happy where it is today, that there's a lot of bad things that happen on the Internet. I would even go so far, and you probably won't find many people in my position, I'd say at this point it's kind of net negative what's played out for the Internet at this point. I don't want it frozen in time where it is. It needs to keep unfolding. And, for example, for my Hello Digital, it needs a huge sort of voice presence component to it, where we as human beings are interacting in our sort of natural voice affinity to each other, that sort of the bad things that happen, whether it's dogs posing as people on the Internet, if you actually are interacting in voice, that is a far more kind of humanizing interaction than the Internet as it is today, you know, through likes and images and commenting. And so I am arguing that we let the Internet continue to unfold. The moment you impose government control on it, that you make government the product manager, it will freeze in time. And we know that, again, because voice quality from 1876 to 1934 dramatically improved. Originally in 1876 they did the whole thing with a single wire. They didn't have a return negative wire, and they were getting all kinds of noise from the earth, and so everything was super staticky. They said, well, gee whiz, let's do this with a return line. And so there was a bunch of innovations that happened until 1934. Boom, in 1934, frozen in time. And why does that happen? Why does it stop? And the reason it stops is because you give the companies that are working on it a new customer. I was at Bell Laboratories from 91 to 96. Bell Laboratories could care less about the end customer. Bell Laboratories had to get the FCC as a product manager to approve everything they did. And so we would go to development meetings, and there would be lawyers sitting there. And the lawyer would have to interpret what we were doing and explain it to the FCC. And I'm like, this is driving me crazy. Why is there a lawyer here? And the answer was, we need to get the okay from the FCC. And guess what? The FCC never said okay. And so what happened was there would be innovations under the hood. They would change things to make things more efficient for themselves. But the end user experience never, ever changed because you've inserted a more powerful. And now the government cannot be ignored, and you can only serve one master. So even though it would be nice, I'd like to keep some customers happy here and there, government can fine you, put you out of business, alter your ability to merge with people. Government is a very powerful master. Next question, the lady in the back. Barry Budars, private citizen. Since the Internet is international, I don't understand why the FCC in the United States should think that they can regulate it. So excellent point. So 
the statement, I think, was the Internet's international, so we don't see why the FCC cannot regulate or should regulate or could. Right, so the Internet is international, and, and the, the reason it is utterly uniform across the planet, at least in terms of the capabilities. Now, governments intervene across the country and, and, and extract capabilities and constrain capabilities in terms of individual, you know, so obviously it's not the same in North Korea or China um, or Europe for that matter. But the reason it was so uniform and the reason it had the scale capability and the reasons that the prices dro dropped so dramatically is because the market was global. Um, Netflix is Netflix because it has a glo global market. Um, and so that uniformity, the moment you take a jurisdiction and you say, in fact, there's a lot of jurisdictions that really want a piece of the Internet, and you impose them on within their territorial boundaries, um, you have now fragmented the Internet. Um, and again, you may have reasons to do that, but nonetheless, you still need Congress to decide that's a good idea. You need to pass the First Amendment, uh, and you need to have some real-world crisis that you're actually trying to solve. Thanks. Gentlemen here. Uh, thank you. Um, I think that it's very interesting to have the track back about uh, the regulation over telecommunication. And I think at that time, we were living in a different era in the world, and the world was more, uh, much less globalized as it is today. Um, but about the regulation of Internet, I don't think that the FCC made a bad move about neutrality of Internet to ensure competitiveness and to ensure access to market to everyone. There, there are good regulations and there are bad regulations. Not all the regulations, I believe, are evil, even if I'm against reg regulations in, in themselves. Don't you think that letting the Internet not neutral would allow another type of regulation that would be the regulation of the corporations that are the mastodons that will be on the market? In other words, it will be the regulation of oligopoly or uh, monopolistic competition over internet where the only uh, collateral damage will be the customer or the rising uh, middle or small companies. Don't you think that? So one aspect of what you're saying, um, you know, you're presuming is that neutrality is a virtue that we want. So let's just hold that thought for a sec. Um, and then the second piece you said is, well, if, if the government isn't controlling things, then we're going to have these monopolies controlling things. And I'd argue that we're already there, right, in the sense that there are monopolies controlling everything. Um, Facebook monopoly controlling things, Google monopoly controlling things, Amazon monopoly. So there are, there are, there are, they're there. And as sort of a case in point, what does the FCC regulation do about those internet monopolies? Nothing. Those inter mon internet monopolies, the real ones, were the ones that imp advocated for this legislate well not in legis for these rules and so it was essentially again it's sort of when you put government in the middle intervening on things you get this sort of power struggle around that that government entity of regulatory arbitrage so you get you know Google trying to disadvantage Verizon from getting into their business because Verizon is going to be regulated um, more than Google's regulated and we know this because Google's enterprise value, every dollar that Google makes turns into $8 of enterprise value. Every dollar that Verizon makes turns into about a buck 50 of enterprise value. And why is that? Because Google can, is non-regulated, can do anything it wants, uh, and would very much like Verizon and, and the service providers to be regulated and not do what they want. So it's, it's a regulatory arbitrage. So putting the government in the middle pushes the customer out, pushes the need to serve the customer out. And then lastly, the question about neutrality. So this is sort of ideological, right? So in the sense that um, once, once somebody will say, and this is kind of throughout the whole, everything that's happening in the United States right now, we want to be neutral to everybody. We want, you know, 
everybody to use different same bathrooms and we don't want any sorts of discrimination discrimination is an inherent evil ok and i will argue that your effort to wipe out that to to neutralize everything is itself destroying the opportunity to solve all those problems and it is sort of a misdirection and and let me just sort of try this sort of on you is that the question of neutrality is a defect in the population ok that the presumption is hey you know we have 330 million people in the united states 7.3 billion in the in the world they just can't get along why does this group fight this group and this group disadvantages it's a defect in in the population and the answer to that defect in the population is guess what government ok government is going to solve that problem in the defect in the population i'm arguing oh wait a minute i actually think we all get along pretty well that it's government and and the management of the platform that is the united states um, that is the problem that let's let's hold government accountable for positive outcomes and and ask is government doing what it should be doing and kind of the, the analogy i use in what in the point i'm trying to make is that the people on the titanic died why did they die okay they died because the captain of the ship wrote it in drove it into an iceberg the the entity that could actually drive and shape where they were going is what sunk that ship it wasn't the fact that the people couldn't swim it wasn't the fact that the water was too cold it was the fact that the guy that was actually had the power to control the outcome and for all those people screwed up and one could argue like what i'm arguing that well today we're making this argument that well no the titanic hit the iceberg because the people couldn't get along clearly there were problems in in the in the population of the passengers of the ship but you you can't assign those problems to the the you know the death of all those people and, and you're disconnecting and so you really got to be careful about defining something as a problem of the, of the population versus defining something as a problem of the government. I can keep going all day asking questions. Yeah. I'm just going to ask one final question. If you could just give us a little bit of uh, looking at the calendar of the next several months. Tell us about uh, the important dates going forward for right. so, the FCC. So let's see. So the Supreme Court case, to summarize, um, we filed for cert with the Supreme Court September 27th, or I did. The carriers who were my co-petitioners um, filed on the 28th. And the reason the Supreme Court case is called Daniel Berninger versus FCC is because I filed first. Then the FCC theoretically had 30 days to reply to our petition. Um, they asked for an extension for 30 days. They did that now three times, and so they got an extra 90 days. So they don't have to reply to us until February 2nd. Um, and then the, the Supreme Court will look at their reply um, and make some decision about whether or not they're going to take the case in the April time frame. But then again, everything else that's going on with respect to the, the FCC re, new reformulation, it may alter the timing. But we should hear um, perhaps in the middle of April as to whether this question about regulation of the Internet gets taken up by the Supreme Court. With that, please join me in thanking Daniel Byrne. Thank you.